Good morning, guys. How we doing? Hey, I'm really excited to be here. Get to do some live worship with people again. Only my second week back. It's really great. So we're going to start off with a little uh, Only King Forever. So why don't you go ahead and stand with me? And we'll start singing. Our God. Our God, a firm foundation. Our rock, the only solid ground. The nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong, now shaken. We trust forever in your name. In the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. Good morning, everybody. So you all have permission, and you have permission if you're watching online. If my mic is turned off, just yell at me. You can yell. I don't care where you are. Uh, you can yell as loud as you want to. Welcome to Community Church. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here, and thank you for being here. Everybody is nicely spread out here in the room today. If you're joining us online, thank you so much for joining us for our live broadcast You'll see a little chat box on the side that you can chat with Dan during this whole service. Um, if you're sitting here, please don't chat with Dan during the whole service because that'll be a little distracting. Um, if you are here for the first time, I know that there are folks that are coming back. Who is this their, their first time back in the building? A few hands. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming. If you're watching us online for the first time and, and we haven't had a chance to meet 
We know that digitally it can be difficult for you to engage. We would love for you to text the word connect. If we could put up that slide, 812, I got to read it, it's real tiny, 575-4229. It gives us a chance to be able to know who you are and say, hey, thanks for joining us and for you to get more information about the church. And I apologize, I'm a little out of breath. That first song is a little upbeat for us as a band. (laughs) A little out of shape, I guess. Hey, a couple things that I I wanted to talk about this morning, uh, real quick before we uh, continue in worship, and that's um, with you folks here and with you folks that are watching online, uh, we know that uh, it is a really weird time right now, right? Can we all agree on that? It's a weird time. I saw a meme this week, and it said if 2020 was a beverage, it would be colonoscopy prep. If you have not had a colonoscopy and you're wondering, go ahead and ask your parents when you get home what that means. Uh, we may have to cut this out of the online that we, we tape, and maybe I shouldn't have said that. Anyways, that is so true. Uh, it is such a weird and difficult time. So I want you to hear my heart on this one, because it's with all uh, love for, for our church and our, our congregation and folks that may be watching for the first time. If, uh, if you're watching online right now because you don't feel comfortable in large groups yet and uh, you feel it's better to stay at home, Thank you so much for continuing to watch. We would just ask that you try to watch regularly and engage, and uh, we have online community groups for you as well if you'd prefer to stay at home. I know for some of us, though, we just liked waking up in our PJs and watching TV on the porch. That was kind of fun for a season. And so there are folks that are still staying home that uh, maybe should come back. Um, I'm going to leave that to you and God, but we would love to see you back in the building. There is something about being together with a group of believers in the same room, worshiping together and praising together that is unmatched. Um, So we would love to have you back when you are good and ready. And for those folks that are here, I've got great news for you. If you've ever wondered, hey, what's my next step? How do I get more involved? Well, with a lot of people staying home right now, we have a lot of open volunteer positions in Kid Connection and in guest services, back in the tech area. And if there's any time that maybe God's going to give you a little kick in the pants, it's right now. We would love to have you raise your hand if you were willing to serve in another area. You can come see myself or Seth or Ann after the service. Um, This is a great opportunity for some of you that have been waiting on the sidelines to get right in the game with the rest of us. And then a second thing, just as a follow-up, you should have got an email this week from Seth on Monday, and then there was a follow-up email from me on Thursday letting you know of some amazing digital tools that will help you engage even further with our church that are coming. We're going to have our own online app, our own community church app for your smartphone, so you can take us on the go and you can listen to us no matter where you are. Our website's going to completely be overhauled. Everything we're doing now will be live streamed on that site. It'll be so cool. Um, But I followed up on Thursday with our transition on online giving. If you are an online giver and give typically uh, through our website, uh, I had new instructions on there. So if you didn't read it, I would love for you to go back and read it. And if you have any questions, please contact me. I know digital stuff can be confusing. Well, I've stammered on too much already, and that colonoscopy joke's gonna, that's gonna haunt me later in the service, I know it. But anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and have you stand, and uh, we're gonna sing a few more songs of worship together, but I'd love to open us up in prayer before we do that. Dear Lord, we, um, we come to you on this really, really hot and muggy day. Um, we just come in, in humbleness and in gratefulness for the ability to to gather together in person for those that are here, to gather together online for those that are watching from home. We know that you work in incredible ways. I ask that your spirit move in this place. I ask that your spirit move through those that are watching online. May you open up our hearts as we worship together. May we sing these songs to you as we're praising you. And may you open our minds and our hearts for what you have to say to us through your word later on. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, if you weren't here last week or you didn't get to check it out online, uh, this is a new song, which I'm extremely excited about because I don't know if you noticed through all of the craziness and quarantine, we haven't introduced a new song in a while. I didn't think it made much sense to have to try to teach you while you were singing at your TV. It's kind of weird. So uh, I'm really excited about this. It's called Sea of Victory. So if this is your first time hearing it, uh, feel free to read the words um, and just kind of let it wash over you, but I think you'll catch on pretty quick. Though 
weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see you victory. I'm going to see you victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see you victory. I'm going to see you victory. For the battle belongs to you. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant. I know how this story is. Oh, I know.
Amen. You may have a seat. You know, when the uh, summer started and we were in the midst of the pandemic and, and everything going on, one of the things we saw in our communities was um, events being pulled out of the summer with all the unknowns, especially for families and for kids, um, with sports being canceled and camps being canceled and other things. And as you know, as a, as a church, we feel like um, we need to be there for our communities, that that's what we're called to, to love on others and to be the hands and feet of Christ. And so one of the ways we've done that, and you, if you've watched it all over these last couple months, you probably have seen that we've done a, a drive-in movie at our Greensburg campus. Now, unlike our Batesville campus, in, in Greensburg we have a nice big parking lot and lots of property, and so um, some volunteers constructed um, uh, a movie screen. Do we have pictures of that movie screen? Got those up? Maybe not. While we look for them. Oh, there we go. Um, we were trying to use a canvas and it didn't work so well. So we literally constructed a temporary wall uh, right in the front. Um, and they projected four movies. It was an awesome opportunity for families that didn't have a lot going on and were in isolation to still be in their own little family unit, but to come and, and do something exciting and fun. So we showed four movies. The last movie was this last Friday. It was Up, which is a great Disney movie. And um, families would come and they'd park their cars. We even had some food trucks come and, and serve folks that were there because we couldn't serve concessions, obviously, with everything going on. Uh, but it was a wonderful opportunity, not just to, to welcome folks onto our campus there and onto our property, to do something that's not churchy and didn't take a whole lot of bravery to step indoors for the first time and into a space where they didn't know people, but just to come to a place where they could be appreciated and loved on. And uh, we wanted to take the opportunity, one, to let you know how awesome it was. We, we love doing it. In fact, I was chatting with Dan this morning about what does next year look like and just, uh, you know, maybe we expand it. It was just a lot of fun. But we wanted to thank you because... It's your continual giving, especially in the midst of all this craziness. It's your generosity through this time that's allowed us to continue to minister to our communities. And, you know, the drive-in movies was one way that was very visible and you heard about it. There were a ton of ways that we helped out individuals and families and organizations these last few months that you won't hear about. Uh, but we were only able to do that because of your continued faithfulness and uh you know, if you call Community Church your home, whether you're here attending or you're watching online, we believe that one of God's call on our hearts is to be in obedience to him, not just with our energy and our time and our talents, but with our finances, because that's often the hardest to give up. 
Um, but I thank you for your continued faithfulness. Uh, we don't pass offering plates on Sundays, as you may know, but we have boxes in the back and uh, one out on the side when you leave. You can drop an offering there, or you can go online to our new, uh, our new platform. It's at give.icommunitychurch.com. Um, but would you uh, take a moment with me as we pray and just thank God for the opportunities he's given us in our communities, as well as for the faithfulness of his people as, as you've continued to be generous. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, um, during this unprecedented first half of the year, and we've joked about 2020 and just how crazy it's been, we know that in the midst of chaos, you have continued to work. In fact, I believe that through this chaos, you've allowed us to work as a church. You've allowed us to impact folks in our community and individual lives in ways we never would have had the opportunity. Um, so we just thank you for... Um, for our Greensburg campus and the property we have there that allows us to do really cool stuff like the drive-in movie. I thank you for all the volunteers that, that uh, put in time and energy to make that happen and put up the screen and showed up every other Friday to, to welcome folks. And uh, we just ask that through that small time maybe that we had with folks that for the first time we're, we're setting foot on church property or people that are wondering and looking for hope and for a God or maybe wanting to give you one last chance that you would give us that opportunity to continue to show you through us. Allow us to continue to minister to our communities as this tough time continues. I thank you for the people here. I thank you for the folks online that continue to give regularly, that allow us to not just do what we do here on Sundays, but throughout the week, impact lives for you. I ask that you be with the gifts that were given this week. Allow us to be wise stewards. Continue to allow us to meet your vision of welcoming all and connecting all to your amazing story. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Speaking of lemons, <laughs> how about that, right? Oh my goodness, right, love technology, love technology. Hey, can you mute the iMac? There we go, perfect. <laughs> oh my goodness, if it weren't for technology, right? This is a blessing and a curse. Hey, welcome everybody. For those of you who are watching online, good morning, thank you so much for being here with us. My name's Seth, I'm one of the pastors here, and we couldn't be more thrilled to have you with us here today as we continue on in the series that we're in. Now, I want to begin today with something really important. So if you've got a pen, paper, or if you want to get a phone out to take a picture of this, uh, it's really, really, really important, and it's going to set up what we're talking about today. It's super pro profound. Here we go. You ready for it? Here it is. Wherever you go, there you are. You all put your phones away. I mean, come on, at least in Greensburg, somebody, somebody actually took a picture. Wherever you go, there you are. Now, that doesn't sound very profound, but I promise you, if you can begin to understand this, as I said, it's the basis of what we're talking about today, this will make a lot more sense here in a couple of minutes, and I promise you it is maybe more significant uh, than you currently know. So anyway, we'll, we'll kind of leave that there. As I mentioned, we're in the beginning of this, or in the middle of a series called When Life Gives You Lemons, When Life Gives You Lemons. And you all know the phrase, what do you do? When life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. lemonade. Yeah, that's right. You make lemonade. And throughout this series, we've been studying somebody from Jewish antiquity. His name is Joseph. Now, if you're newer to Bible study, you may not know that there are actually two Josephs in the Bible. You may be thinking Joseph as in married to Mary and Jesus' earthly father, Joseph. But there's actually another one that Donny Osmond made famous in the 1990s. And some of you are like, who is Donny Osmond? 
And I would tell you, you were born after 1990, probably, and you just have no clue. And that's okay. Um, it's a remarkable man. We've been talking about his life over the last couple of weeks, and we've got a couple more weeks in this series. We're kind of right at the midpoint today. And we've been talking about all these lemons, right, that he had in life. Now, um, sometimes it's, it's easy to think, well, you know, we, you and I, I mean, we have lemons. We all have lemons in life, whether it's what's going on right now with the coronavirus or racial tensions or stuff at work or stuff at home and the relationship with our kids, with sports. I mean, we've all, you know, we've all got these things. But the truth is Joseph maybe had more than any of us. And if we were to sit down with Joseph and say something a lot about, you know, well, you know, I had a broken family growing up. Joseph might look at us and say, well, my dad had two wives, and then he had two concubines in addition to those wives, and, you know, my mom died when she was giving birth to my younger brother, and then my oldest brother slept with one of my dad's concubines, and it's like, okay, you win, Joseph, you win, I got it, you know, or maybe some unfair things happened to me in life, and Joseph might say, well, my brothers hated me so much they sold me into slavery. What happened with you again? And, you know, now, to be fair, I don't think Joseph would actually say that to us, because I think his character was a little bit stronger than that. But you get the point. I mean, and, and sometimes w- when you're looking at a person like Joseph and you're looking at their life, it's so easy, at least for us, so many years later, about 4,000 years later, that we know the end of the story, right? I mean, we know what happens with Joseph. For those of you who may not be as familiar with the story, we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. But essentially, he becomes the vice president of Egypt. I mean, he's second in charge to nobody other than Pharaoh. And, um, you know, God does show up in his life eventually, But in the moment, in the moment, we kind of forget what it might have been like for him as his brothers sold him into slavery. He went 13 years, 13 years without seemingly any resolution to what had been done to him. And even after that, it was another seven years before he had any resolution with his family. So 20 years, I mean, just think about that. I know for you and I, I mean, we we kind of get stuck in the moment and we see what happened in our past and we see what's happened kind of in our present, but we don't know the future. And we don't know where things are headed. And so that's kind of the tension that we all deal with. And so throughout this series, I've been talking about a verse and reminding you of a verse that was written by a man named Paul, who was an early church leader. It's, uh, uh, Paul wrote this to Christians, which means if you're watching today or if you're here today and you don't consider yourself a follower of Jesus yet, you can't cling to this promise. But this is a good reason why I think you should consider following Jesus, because it's an amazing promise. And it's a promise that's built on the concept that God is sovereign which is a fancy way of saying that God is in control. And yes, we have free choices. I do believe that, that you and I get to choose what we do with our lives. I think Joseph's brothers chose to sell him into slavery. We have free choices, and yet somehow in the midst of that, God is still at work. And so Romans chapter 8, verse 28, here's what Paul said. He said, and we know that in all things, God works for the good. That in all things, God works for the good. That he is moving things toward the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That God has your life and that he has my life on a trajectory of good. That he is moving in us. Now, that doesn't mean that every circumstance we face in life is good. In fact, to the contrary, there are some really terrible circumstances that people face in life. Joseph faced un thinkable circumstances. Jesus, as he was crucified on the cross, I mean, he faced unbelievable circumstances. But God, in the midst of that, was doing something good. Now, the problem is, sometimes life doesn't feel good. I mean, there there are moments in time, we can all admit, when, when something happens at work, or when something happens with the family, or you get the diagnosis. I mean, there are times in life where it just doesn't feel like it's good. Lemon trucks, you know, keep showing up at our door. And yet, in the midst of that, we've been saying something, and this is you know, a fill in the blank. So I'm going to see how much you all have been paying attention, those of you who have been with us for the last couple of weeks, that when life gives you lemons, you can trust God is, anybody know? Thank you. Yes, making lemonade. You guys were way better than the Greensburg campus this morning, but they were still asleep. I think they knew. I think the coffee just hadn't, you know, settled in yet at nine o'clock. But anyway, that, that, that your good is God's intention. That your good is God's intention. Now, again, that doesn't mean there's nothing hard that we ever deal with in life. But God's good is different than our good. Our definition of good is improved or improving circumstances, that things are getting better. In my mind, God's definition of good is growing our faith, refining our faith, and strengthening our hope in who he is and what he's doing. 
Now, one of the uncomfortable truths about Joseph, and I think sometimes Christians can be really intellectually dishonest, and so I'm just going to throw that out there, and I try to be as intellectually honest about what I read in Scripture and what I think about what I read in Scripture. This is just one of those things that I think if we were all honest with each other, we would just all admit, and that's that we can do all the right things. We can do all the right things and still get more lemons. We can do all the right things and still get more lemons. I mean, that song that we just sang, and for the record, I asked Josh to lead us in that song, you are good, good, oh, oh, you are good, good, oh, oh, but the truth is life does not always seem good, and we don't always feel that God is good, that I can do the wise thing, I can do the right thing, I can do the godly thing, I can pray, I can give, I can show up, I can do all the right things, and yet life doesn't always move in the direction that I want it to go in. That goes against what I want to believe is true. And yet, as we study the life of Joseph, the thing we discover is that God did have his life on a trajectory of good. That God was working behind the scenes. He was working all things. Not every circumstance was good. But he was working all things together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purposes. Now, today, we're going to talk about that confusing thing when life keeps handing us lemons. And I've got a question for you because I think it's an important question. And the question is simply this. When life gives you more lemons, how do you know God is still with you? When life gives you more lemons, when you do the right thing, when you pray the right prayers, when you study, when you read, when you pray, and yet the wrong conclusion comes your way. How do you know? How do you know that God's still with you? Even when you can't feel it, how do you know that God is still with you? What keeps you from walking away from your faith in those moments? I think that's a really important question to ask. Because when, when life happens, we all have this moment in time where, where we think this, right? Where we think this. Let's stick it up there, Sam. If God is always with me, shouldn't my circumstances improve? Have you ever thought that before? I mean, I'll just admit it. And, and I want you to just take a moment and not feel bad if you've ever felt that before, because I think that's just part of the human experience. If God's always with me, shouldn't things get better? I mean, if God's always there, shouldn't things get better? But the problem is that when we stay at this point, and I realize, you know, you may be in here today and, and you went through a season of questioning God and doubting God because things didn't get better. They didn't go the way you thought they should have gone. And in those moments, it can shipwreck a person's faith. We talked about that a couple months ago. So how do you know? How do you know? The problem is when, you, when, you, when we stay at this place, which is kind of a natural place to go, it leads to what I'd like to call circumstantial faith. That is, faith that's based on our circumstances. That is, if life is going well, if I get the promotion, if she says yes, you know, if we get the date, if we, we get pregnant, if, if I get, you know, whatever, you know, I make the team, then life is good, God's good, oh, I can feel his presence, he is good, good, oh, oh, he is good, good, oh, oh. But when things go the opposite way, when things don't go the way we want, it leads us to point a finger. And it leads us to question, where is God? How can God be good and this be happening to me? See, the problem with circumstantial faith is this. The circumstantial faith isn't actually faith. It actually defies the definition of faith because the definition of faith is a little bit different. The definition of faith that, that we receive from the book of Hebrews, from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, is now faith is confidence in what we hope for. Now, if there's something you hope for, that means you don't have it yet, right? There's confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Because if we could see it, we wouldn't need to have faith about it. If we could hold on to it, if it was currently in our presence, then we wouldn't need to have confidence that it was going to come to us later. See, hope is something that we hope for later. It's something that we believe is going to come later, something greater later in the midst of what I'm dealing with right now. Now, here's the thing, because I, you know, I realize there are moments in time where we all question, where, where something bad happens to us, and we wonder, where is God? My point is we can't stay there. We can't stay at that place. And that's where I believe our stories intersect with the person of Joseph. 
because he didn't stay there. In fact, I don't know if he even went there ever, but he didn't stay there certainly because he was able to see God's hand in the midst of the hard things that he was going through in life. Now, where we left off last week, in case you weren't with us, Joseph had been sold into slavery by his brothers. Um, They hated him. They despised him. Whether it was an aggression against their father, we don't really know for sure, but we know they, they got rid of him. They sold him into slavery, and he was sent to the auction block where he was purchased by a man who was an official in Pharaoh's kind of court. Uh, his name was Potiphar. He was the, the head of the guard, and Potiphar took him into his home. And even when Joseph was sold into slavery, even as he's entering into Potiphar's house, God, we read, was still with Joseph. Here's what the text says in Genesis chapter 39, verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And when the master saw, when the master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. That when Potiphar realized that the Lord was with Joseph and that God's presence was going with Joseph, he wanted in on it, I believe, and he he recognized that there was something unique about this man. And so he put him in a place of authority inside his own household, and he kept nothing from him except for one thing, his wife, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, Well, we don't know if, anyway, we'll leave that there. So so he, he, you know, Joseph is, is in Potiphar's house. I have to believe that Joseph had a pretty positive attitude when he was in Potiphar's house, because I don't know if you've ever been around a sour person who's been soured by their experiences. They're not generally the person you want to put in charge, right? I mean, <laughs> my guess is that Joseph was, was a positive attitude, that he had kind of a, a recognition of God's presence, that God was with him. And so it's because of that that Joseph ended up being put in charge of Potiphar's household. And over time, things began to go south. Here's what the text says. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. Now, this is actually one of the only times throughout the pages of the Bible where somebody's physical description is given. So, uh, you know, he's a good-looking kind of guy. He's a slave. He's probably got big muscles and a little bounce chicken wow wow right, going on. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. She found him either irresistible or she had some kind of tiff with her husband. We don't know exactly, but we know that she began approaching him and wanted a relationship with him. And, you know, quite honestly, that's what powerful men do to gain more power. Can you imagine if Joseph had welcomed this relationship, this, the position he would then have in the house as he tells all the other slaves, you know, I'm, I'm sleeping with the, our master's wife. Most people would refuse that or wouldn't refuse that rather, but Joseph did refuse it. Here's what the text says. He refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. They went on and said, no one is greater. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God. How could I do such a wicked thing? It's not just disrespecting my master, it's sinning against God. Because I want to do the faithful thing, regardless of my circumstances, regardless of what's happening in my life, regardless of whether or not things are moving in the direction I think they should move in, I'm going to do the faithful thing. And I'm not going to sin against God. Because I know he's here with me. I know he was with me as my brother sold me into slavery. I know that he's with me as I was put on the auction block. I know he's with me here in Potiphar's house. I know, I know that his presence goes with me wherever I go. Now, here's the thing, you know, I don't think any one of us would point a finger of blame if Joseph were to say, God did this to me. God could have stepped in. He could have changed this. I mean, honestly, many of us have pointed a finger of blame at God for lesser things. And yet his character in the midst of it was, I'm not going to point a finger at God. I'm not going to sin against him. I'm going to do what is right. 
So you may know the story. Mrs. Potiphar kept coming after him, and he kept turning her down. He kept coming after her, or she kept coming after him. He kept turning her down until finally she couldn't take it anymore. And we don't know if she orchestrated the situation or if it was happenstance. I personally believe she orchestrated it, but I don't know. Joseph showed up one day, and there was no one there. The house is empty except for Mrs. Potiphar. And she grabs him and says, come to bed with me. And Joseph, looking her in the face, said, no. And he fled out of there, and she held on to his cloak. It slipped off of him, and she was mad. And so she used the opportunity to tell everybody else, to call the other household help in and say, this man tried to rape me. And then she even came up with this concocted story to tell her husband. So when he came home, here's what she said to him. She told him this story, that Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me, but as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and he ran out of the house. That Hebrew slave that you brought in here. Now imagine Joseph in these moments as he's now being accused of something that he didn't do. For a second time, his clothing has been taken from him and been used against him. And what could Potiphar do? I actually don't believe Potiphar believed his wife. And the reason I don't believe that is because he was the head of the guard. He could have had Joseph beheaded, and that would be a likely punishment for what Joseph supposedly had done. But he didn't do that. He threw him in prison. In fact, it set up what God was going to use Joseph for later as Potiphar entrusted some some inmates to his care. In these moments, I just can't imagine what was going through Joseph's mind because he did the right thing and he suffered for it. He did the faithful thing. And it seemed like God had abandoned him. But the text says, but while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was, I want you to read this with me, with him. That God didn't abandon him. Even though God still. Even though the circumstances were less than ideal, even though things didn't just stay the same, they actually got worse, right? I mean, they, they backtracked. Now he's, now he's in prison. I mean, where's the justice? Where's the fairness? Where's the recognition of Joseph's good character for choosing to do the right thing? Where is that? I don't know about you, but I mean, for me, I focus on good or improving circumstances, and that wasn't it. But what this highlights is so important that God's good is bigger than my circumstances. God's good is bigger than my circumstances. God's good is bigger than your circumstances, and the proof is that God was still with him, and God had his life on a trajectory of good, and there was something good that would come later. Here's the evidence how God was with him. The text continues. He showed kindness to him and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Now, I kind of laugh about this because I think to myself, I don't want favor in the eyes of a prison warden unless he's my neighbor and he's a really cool guy, right? I mean, (laughs) I'm not interested in having a relationship with a prison warden. And yet, you know, Joseph had that. And I don't know if he got to push the little library card around or have a shower or beer on the roof with his friends, as in Shawshank Redemption, in case you're curious where that came from. Um, And that's not in the text. I made that piece up. But nonetheless, I mean, God gives him favor in the eyes of the prison warden, and he recognizes that there is something good. Because here, here's the thing. Wherever Joseph went, there he was. And his steadiness and his faithfulness to God went with him wherever he went. His character did not change even though his circumstances did. And because God's presence was with him, We read, so that the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Because wherever he went, there he was, and he he was faithful in whatever he did, and God gave him more responsibility through the hands of the prison warden. Joseph did not focus on changing his circumstances. He focused on being faithful. And then two new inmates came. You perhaps know the story. It was the the chief cupbearer and the chief baker who were part of Pharaoh's court. And it actually says that the head of the guard put them under Joseph's care, which indicates that Potiphar is the one who came and said, Joseph, I want you to care for these men who are now in prison. So these two new inmates are there in the prison, and over time they begin having 
uh, dreams. They both have a dream one night, individual dreams, and they wake up and they're very troubled by this. And so Joseph recognizes this, and here's what the text says. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked them, why do you look so sad today? And they continue on. We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. And then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. And so the men told their dreams, and the cupbearer, he went first. He had a dream where there were three large grapes that he squeezed into a chalice, and then they gave the chalice to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh drank it. And so Joseph listened to the dream, and he said, in three days, you're going to be restored back to your position, and when you are, remember me. And so the baker, you know, he heard this, this interpretation. He's thinking to himself, that's awesome. I want to hear my interpretation. So his dream was a little bit different. In his dream, he had three baskets of bread on his head, and birds were eating the bread out of the baskets. And so Joseph said, well, the interpretation of your dream is in three days your head will be cut off, you'll be impaled on a stake, and birds will eat your flesh. Not as good of an interpretation as the first dream, but what happened was exactly what Joseph interpreted. What God gave Joseph as the interpretation absolutely came true, but the chief cupbearer, he didn't remember Joseph, and for two more years, for two more years, Joseph was there in prison circumstances didn't change. He did the right thing, and things didn't get better. So one day, Pharaoh had a couple of dreams, the kind of dreams that you wake up from and you think, what did I eat last night to cause this? One of the dreams was they were standing by the Nile River, and seven fat cows came out of the Nile and started grazing, and then seven skinny gaunt cows came out, and then they ate the fat cows. And he woke up, and he kind of scratched his head. He's like, what was that about? Then he fell back asleep and he had another dream. And this time there were seven heads of grain that were plump and juicy and they looked tasty. And then there were seven wind-scorched heads of grain that ate those big, fat, plump, juicy heads of grain. And he woke up and he was so troubled by this, he began asking people because he believed there was something behind these dreams. And so he asked around all of his officials, you know, help me understand these dreams. And nobody knew what they meant until finally the cupbearer said, "Um, you know, Pharaoh, I don't want to remind you of this, but one time I was in prison. Let's not think about why I was in prison. But one time I was in prison, and while I was there, I had some dreams. And, you know, there was this Hebrew slave who was able to interpret the dreams for me, and you might want to check with him. And so Pharaoh beckoned Joseph. He was shaved. He was bathed. He was brought before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, you know, he's standing before him. This is his opportunity, his chance. And Pharaoh says to him, I hear you're able to interpret dreams. Now, I love what Joseph says in response to this, because think about this. This is your chance. I mean, this is your moment. The thing you've been waiting for, Joseph had been, you know, sold into slavery 13 years ago. So here's his chance. Here's what he says. I cannot do it. (laughs) I cannot do it. Now, what would you say to Pharaoh, right? I can interpret your dream. You know, I've got a good answer for you. I mean, this is your get-out-of-jail-free card. And his response is, I can't do it. Now, why would he answer it this way? I think Joseph wasn't hell-bent on changing his circumstances. I think he was simply trying to be faithful wherever it was that he was. Because wherever he went, that's where he was. And his character is what came through each and every time. He said, I can't do it, Joseph replied, but God... God who allowed me to be sold into slavery, God who was with me even then, God who was with me when I was in Potiphar's house, God who was with me when Mrs. Potiphar wrongfully accused me of raping her, God who was with me when I was in prison, God who was with me two years ago when I thought I might get out, but I didn't, God who was with me will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. I can't, but God will. And the interpretation, again, many of us know this story, but you can go read it for yourself. The interpretation was there are going to be seven years of plenty, and then there will be seven years of famine. And by the way, Pharaoh, if you don't mind me saying so, you might want to think about finding somebody to administrate and and gather up, you know, all the the grain, the extra grain during these seven years of plenty and store it up, and then you can distribute it over the seven years of famine, and I think everything will be okay in the end. And Pharaoh says, does anybody know somebody who would be a good administrator? Hey, wait a second, you seem kind of wise. You seem like you know what you're doing. Why don't we put you in that position? And Joseph gets promoted to this new position And wherever he went, there he was. His character didn't change. His circumstances finally changed. But he always operated with this confidence that God is who he claims to be and he will do all he promised to do. See, here's my point. 
My point is what matters isn't where you are, but who you are. What matters isn't where you are, but who you are. Because the truth is the grass is always greener somewhere else. I mean, it always is. In a different school, in a different marriage, with different kids, with different team, different coach, different teacher. I mean, you know, the grass is always greener. There's always somewhere else to look. And we can get so focused on trying to change our circumstances that we miss what it is that God is doing in the midst of it. Joseph had two options every single time. Every place he was, he could complain about what was going on and try and change his circumstances, or he could choose to be faithful with whatever God had placed in front of him. And every single time, Joseph chose to be faithful. And over and over and over again, God was still with him. Every time, God never abandoned him, ever wherever he went, he was faithful. See, Joseph's circumstances didn't change his faithfulness to God. Now, I'm not saying there weren't ever nights where he cried out to God and said, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Why didn't you change something? Why don't you step in and do something? He may have had many of those nights. I don't know. I mean, I probably would too. But it didn't change his day-to-day behavior. It didn't change his day-to-day response. And so my question for you, and the thing that I think this behooves us to think about, is what about you and your circumstances? What about you and what's going on at school or at work or with your family or with your aging parents or your retirement? How are you being faithful in your circumstances? Now, don't misunderstand me. There are times to change our circumstances. I am not saying we just need to grin and bear it and put on a fake smile and say it's all going to be good, let go and let God. I'm not saying that. If you're in an abusive situation, you need to get out. I am not in any way, you know, saying just, you know, let let it go. But my point is that we can change our circumstances, but if we never address what's going on on the inside, changing the circumstances won't actually solve the problem. We just move it somewhere else. We forget about who we are as the common denominator. Do you know the common denominator in all of your problems? You are. (laughs) Do you know the common denominator in all my problems? You are. No, I'm just kidding. I am. I, I, I am the common denominator. Wherever I go, there I am. We can't get away from it. And when we focus, when we focus on changing our circumstances, we miss seeing God's work where we are. Because problems have a way of following us, don't they? They follow us into a new marriage. They follow us into a new job. They follow us across the country. They follow us into other states. They follow us across the globe. Wherever we go, there we are. And Joseph was focused on being faithful. And I think that leads us to ask a really important question. And the question that we need to be asking ourselves on a regular basis is, what is the next faithful thing? What is the next faithful thing for me? What's the next faithful thing for my family? What's the next faithful step that I can take as one who is confident that God is who he says he is, that he'll do all he's promised to do, that he hasn't abandoned me, even though I can't see him right in this moment, even though the coronavirus is going on, even though things are stressful at home, even though I've got this problem at work, even though I don't know what to do about school, what is the next faithful thing in the moment and how do I do it? Instead of focusing on changing the world around us, what would a person do who's confident that God is who he promised to be, that he is who he claims to be and he'll do all he's promised to do? What would a person do in those circumstances. In your work situation, maybe your boss is a jerk. I don't know. But what would a person do who believes that God is who he claimed to be and he'll do all he's promised to do? What would a person who's trying to please God, regardless of what's going on around him, as Joseph did, what would a person who believes that God is still in control, that he is sovereign, that he has our lives on a trajectory of good, what would a person do to be faithful in those circumstances? 
Or it's in your marriage and you think, I married the wrong person. Well, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I don't know. That's not the question. The question is, what does it look like to be faithful in this moment? What would a person who's faithful do in this situation, who believes that God is who he claimed to be and he'll do all he's promised to do? That's the question. Because wherever Joseph went, there he was. Wherever you go, there you are. The circumstances can change, but I'm still the same until I begin addressing me. And learning to ask what's the next faithful thing will lead us to the point of experiencing God's presence and knowing that he is still with us, even when things around us may be falling apart. My friends, that is the invitation for us as we think about Joseph's life and we think about what God did in him and through him and the reminder that God was still with him. And he's with you too. He cares about you. He demonstrated that by sending Jesus to die for you. Don't forget that. So what's the next faithful thing? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I am so glad this, this story, this account has been preserved for so many years. I am so thankful for the life of Joseph that we can look at, we can study, we can see parallels in our own lives. Truth is, life is hard. I mean, there are lemons that we all deal with on a regular basis. It is challenging. And it is easy to want to just change our circumstances and think that everything's going to be easier if only this one thing would change, if I could you know, move to a different place, or find a new house, or get a different job, or whatever it is. God, I just pray in those moments that we would focus on being faithful to you over changing the scenery for a few minutes. God, thank you that we can cling to that knowing and trusting that you are good and that our good is your intention. Father, thank you for the words of Paul that we can cling to. I pray that you would help each one of us know what the next faithful thing to do is wherever we find ourselves today, this week, and the weeks ahead. And then you would help us to do it. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, Look, I I don't know what situation you've been in. I don't know what your circumstances are. Um, But my hope is that you've been faithful to where he's brought you and where he's leading you. And I know some of you are still struggling with that. Some of you at home may be struggling with that, and that's why you're still at home. May you continue to be faithful to what he's called you to. Just open yourself up to that question. What is the next faithful thing that he has called for you in your life? Thanks again for being here. We're going to see you next week. Uh, We look forward to it. The stage will look a little bit different as we get ready for our vacation Bible school. But I hope you have a wonderful day. Stay inside in the air conditioning, please. I don't want you to melt. Talk to you all later.